Brilliant. Thank you very much. Good. Fab. Well, my name's Chloe and I'm a senior program manager at Food for Life and I've um, seen the magic of the Food for Life Early Years Award uh, in many nurseries up and down the country. Um, it's fantastic to have so many people here at the end of a very busy Thursday. Um, so yeah, all sit down, relax and we'll let Food for Life's brilliant nutrition trainer Lee Harland entertain you all uh, with this webinar on uh, nutrition and menu planning in early years settings. Um, we've got a diverse audience here today, fantastic to have so many people. Um, there'll be some nurseries on here and, and early years representatives that are only encountering food for life for the first time today. Some of you might be here from nurseries or early years settings um, that are just starting to work through the Food for Life Award. Um, and others that have already achieved the dizzy heights of that Food for Life Award um, and are here to kind of refresh your knowledge. Brilliant to have you all along and uh, yeah, share and learn together. For those that don't know about Food for Life, uh, I'll just say uh, by way of an intro that Food for Life, at Food for Life, we're really passionate about making good food the easy choice for everybody, whatever postcode or background you're from. So in a nursery context, that means supporting cooks um, so that they can really enjoy the, the menus that they're preparing, be really confident that they're sourcing really fantastically good quality food for the children in their care um, and that they're reducing the environmental impact of that of those ingredients as well. For early years practitioners, that's about getting involved in, in creative, uh, playful food education activities. So cooking, growing, making art with food, you name it. Um, for managers, it's about having that confidence to, to lead a good food culture. Um, and also it's about the wider community, the, of the, the parents and, and uh, other members of the community and involving those in the good food movement that you're starting from your nursery. At the heart of the award, the award obviously are the small people in your setting um, and our aspiration is that every child leaves a Food for Life nursery not only having got the nutrition to give them a really good start in life, but so that they move, leave nursery and move into primary school, really knowing how to eat well, how to be adventurous eaters and having some knowledge of, of where food comes from. On that note, I'm going to pass over to Lee Harland, who is Food for Life's trainer. She's going to talk to us for about um, 40 minutes around uh, nutrition and menu planning. And we've all, we're also lucky enough to have some representatives from Maple Tree Nursery in Warsaw on the line who are going to give us a bit of a case study after Lee's presented around um, the work that they've done to, to develop their menus. Um, just before I pass over to Lee, uh, in terms of housekeeping, yet. Yeah, if we could all just use the chat function for any questions. If you're uncertain about something Lee said and you'd like her to repeat it, pop it in the chat uh, and I, I'll feed those through to her and there will be that Q&A at the end. Over to you, Lee. You are on mute. <laughs> there we go. Helpful. Welcome everybody. Um, great to see so many of you um, from from your settings attending today's um, webinar. Um, but thanks for the introduction, Chloe. My name's Lee Harland and I'm the Food for Life Nutrition Trainer um, and focusing on food quality um, with the with the Soil Association. Um, we do ask for some pre and post evaluation data just at the start and end of the session. Um, so if you can and you don't mind, um, just via the chat function and we've got Ali behind the scenes who's managing the, the, the chat and any questions um, just so that we can try and get some information, pre information from you guys and hopefully after the session some post um, positive um, comments from you guys um, going forward. So that would be great. So today we'll be looking at menu planning in your early year settings and how to create a compliant menu that meets the voluntary food and drink standards um, and also looking at the Food for Life Early Years Award, um, particularly the food quality section um, within the award. And really, um, 
it's it's a nice um, opportunity here for for me to to offer some advice and tips, I suppose, on how to plan your settings meals um, that are compliant against these um, voluntary standards, and just give you really a bit of background as to kind of why this is necessary. Um, within settings, particularly um, for children under the ages of, of five. So what we'll look at, um, next slide, um, Ali, please. The objectives, um, we're going to look at, um, hopefully increase the confidence in planning a menu that meets the nutri nutrient requirements um, of children aged one to four. We're going to look at the standards in some depth and also the food quality section of the Food for Life Award. Um, understand the links between healthy, sustainable menus um, and whole setting approach. And like Chloe said, we're um, really, really pleased to have Maple Tree Nursery here to, to give a bit of um, information and, and showcase some of the great work that they've, they've been doing in their setting as well. So there is, just to pre-warn you, there is a lot of information to take in here and we don't have a, well, we, we've got pretty much 45 minutes to try and rattle through quite a lot of information. But please, um, if you've got any um, information or um, that you want to share or any um, questions that you want to ask afterwards, I'm always at the end of a phone or an email that I can specifically, you know, support you guys with um, around this this topic, if that's OK with everybody. So just to get started, um, questions about you. Um, the In the chat, if you don't mind, could you note down there's three things that we want to kind of get some information from you guys. One, how do you currently plan your menus? So is it that you you work alone? Is it something that you've been given by a manager or that is just your responsibility? Is it because you've got a real passion about um, providing good food in your settings? How do you go about doing it? So just a couple of jogger notes um, that would be great. And then where do you get your recipe ideas from? Um, do you get them uh, from a Google search? Do you pinch them from the setting down the road? Um, do you follow the, the Food for Life kind of award and, and take some of the, the recipe suggestions from then? How, where do you get them from? That's kind of where we, what we want to know from you. And then um, the third one is I just want to know how confident that you feel planning a menu against these standards um, and rating your store, score between one and five, where one is very confident and five is not so confident. Um, just to give us a kind of understanding as, as to kind of where you are on this journey. Everybody's different and everybody's settings will be different and in a different kind of situation. So we're here to, to pro provide some information um, and support where we can. OK, next slide, please. Current diets of one to five year olds. So this is just really just wanted to um, Sorry, I'm getting lots of comments here and it's beep, beep, beeping. Um, so current diets for one to five year olds. So the evidence out there shows um, and tells us that children of this particular age group, they're low in iron, zinc and vitamin A, high in saturated fat, sugar and salt. Many young children um, are, are not getting their, their five a day at all, um, which is frightening. So what are the consequences? of this. Next slide, Ali. So in England, statistics show that children under five um, are over 13% of them are overweight and over 10% of them are obese, with rickets now on the increase um, with over 250 cases per year. So we know that the energy intake um, of children is way too high, um, uh, which is obviously have an, an impact on the obesity statistics. Children are not reaching their full potential. There's an increase in tooth decay. Um, iron deficiency is, is rife with children um, being diagnosed with anemia and fatigue. Um, and obviously the, the vitamin D deficiency, which is leading to the increase um, in, in rickets. It's a pretty scary story, really, um, and picture out there for these poor children. 
So this slide here um, is just just want you to have a look. I just want you to it's really just food for thought. Um, just what do you see? Is this the norm? Are we shocked? Are these things that you're um, you're seeing within your settings when children are coming into your settings? Um, pack lunches that might be provided um, outside of the settings. How kind of um, the norm is this? Um, and are you shocked? You don't have to answer the question. It's just really to kind of, um, you know, to, to paint the picture of kind of where we are in society with regards to child health. So next slide, Ali. Um, providing a healthy balanced diet and childcare settings will support the growth and development through weight and height, strong immune function, good cognition, prevention of short term and long term ill health um, and increased relationships and good mental health. Diet and nutrition at a young age is crucial to future health um, in adults particularly. So next slide, Ali. Food and nutrition. Um, there's loads and loads and loads of words out there with regards to nutrition um, and it's quite a complex subject and some of the words around nutrition and nutrients and standards and frameworks they get thrown around all over the place and particularly for you guys um, who are having to deliver on for example menu planning and nutrition it becomes quite complicated so what I want to do really is just kind of break it down a little bit um, so we'll look at all you need to know about the food and drink that you provide to ensure it meets the dietary um, recommendations and nutritional needs for children in your care. So we'll look at what are nutrients, we'll look at a nutrient framework and then we'll look at food standards and hopefully by the end of this session we'll be able to kind of understand which each one is and, 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 and where its kind of role lies within, within the setting. So a nutrient, um, again, you've probably heard um, of macros and micronutrients, that word being thrown around the place. So your macronutrients um, are your fats, carbohydrates and proteins. And your micros, which mean tiny, are your vitamins and minerals. So the likes of vitamin A, C, D, for example, and there's loads of other ones and your minerals are iron. Again, examples are iron and calcium. And iron, calcium and zinc is another one that we'll talk about, um, are the minerals um, that are crucial for child health, um, which I'll go into a little bit more detail about. Then we come on to a nutrient framework. And a nutrient framework sets out the proportion of nutrients that a population group, so in this case, it's children under the age of five, should receive and then from that nutrient framework comes the food standards which are your voluntary food and drink standards for early year settings and that's what we're going to look at and break down um, and just hopefully kind of understand a little bit about what's required under the standards so the food standards basically have done the work they've taken the nutrient framework and all of the information from the nutrients and put them into standards to then be implemented across the, the, the setting. So the food standards, they actually outline the type of food that children should be offered at each meal. Um, and under the standards, um, across a full day offering, we're looking at breakfast, lunch, tea and snack provision, all to be compliant across the full day. So to provide practical guidance for you to use, the nutrient requirements for young children have been translated into these voluntary um, food and drink standards to try and make it a little bit easier for everybody to understand because it's a minefield. Even somebody with a background in nutrition um, education, it's still a minefield. Um, so please don't be put off by, by any of this. Next slide, Ali. The early years voluntary food and drink standards. So they were, um, they're based on recommendations made by an advisory panel um, back in 2010. They have been updated in 2017, which now includes sugar and energy guidance, 
um, and it ensures that the meal and snack provision provide the correct intakes of your macros, which are your protein, fats and carbohydrates, and your micros being vitamin A, C, iron, zinc and calcium. OK. Um, oops. So next slide, Ali. We're on to the guidance itself. So this slide here um, is a picture of if you've, if nobody's seen the guidance, this is what it looks like. It's called Eat Better, Start Better. Um, it's a fantastic resource that all settings should have a copy of. Um, it gives a real clear guidance and examples of menus against the standards. But don't be don't be put off. But it is 86 pages long which is why we thought the need for um, a, a webinar or a training session just to kind of go through the standards um, and the guidance because it is an awful lot and you guys are very busy people, which which we fully understand. Um, so it's it's there, it can be downloaded and there will be a copy sent um, around after the webinar. And just to just to remind you that there will be supporting material sent to all of you after the webinar. Um, around menus and guidance and everything. So, so please, if you, if you think I'm going a little bit too fast, everything will be sent to you um, afterwards, just to kind of recap on. Next slide, Ali. Yep. Young children have relatively high energy requirements for their size, but they only have tiny stomachs. So it's really important that they eat little and often, at least every three hours. And you might think, oh, my crikey, that's I mean, we're just we've just done one meal. Now we're on to the next. And I know myself, um, I haven't, I've got two small children and it really does feel that you, you, you can't breathe before it's the next meal, thinking about what to provide, what to provide, what to provide. So it's. Um, and then the reason being is because they they've got really high energy um, needs and nutrients that they need throughout the day. And it's also really important um, that good communication with carers and parents is is essential when you're kind of in your setting just to have that conversation with them around. Oh, they've, they've had this such and such for breakfast. They've had this for lunch. They've had this for tea um, just to keep um, the, the, you know, the, the communication going is vitally important. Next slide, Ali. Balancing requirements throughout the day. So younger children need healthy snacks between meals that are appropriate portion sizes for their age to meet the nutritional requirements. And this diagram outlines um, how much food should be provided across a full day in childcare if all meals are provided to meet the nutrition requirements for this age group. And I know that not not all um, not all slight um, settings, sorry, provide a full offering. I, I totally understand that. Lee. Yeah. I'm really sorry to interrupt. There's a few people who are saying their slides aren't moving forward and I just wanted to check oh. in um, how many people that's happening to because there's about four people uh, okay. that um, have said that that's happening uh, in the chat. Um, there is likely to be a bit of a lag uh, for everyone. Um, yeah, um, some, some people are saying it's catching up now. I think, it's okay. great. I think it will depend on your connection a little bit. Right. Um, so I think there is a bit of a lag. So uh, apologies for that, everybody. Um, yeah, somebody's saying it was about three minutes after it, it, we uh -huh. changed it, changed for them. So um, I guess Possibly. we'll just need to bear that in mind. It sounds like it's not happening for everybody and I'm sorry if that's happening for you. Um, we will certainly be sharing the slides afterwards. Um, I think the slide you should be seeing now is a plate that's like a pie chart separated into different percentages. So if you can't see that, if you could just say in the chat. Yeah. Um, but I think it's likely the slides will ca catch up. Um, there's just a bit of a delay for some people, I think, and I'm, I'm very sorry for that. I don't think there's anything we can do centrally to stop that from happening. Yeah. 
you you will you will get the um the slides afterwards like um chloe said and i'm always here at the end of the phone or you know on an email that i can talk and you know through anything with anybody need if needs be um so i was uh, just talking about oh yeah so balancing requirements throughout the day um so this diagram here um shows the the percentages of energy required for children under the age of four um, within a, a setting who offers a full food setting. So that is breakfast, lunch and tea, plus snacks as well. So it quite clearly states here that 20% of energy required is provided by breakfast. I'm gonna to jump to the next one, which is the biggie, and that's 30% of energy required um, provided by lunch. And then the next one is 20% by tea. Now tea and lunch can be reversible, to fit obviously the type of setting that you have. Um, and then the 10%, you've got 30% um, energy required for snacks throughout the day. Um, and I, I'm aware that all settings are, are different um, and not all settings do provide the, the full offering. Next slide, Ali. So what is the ideal healthy balanced diet? Um, and I'm just kind of going to can skim through this because um, this we could do a full webinar on comparing adult to child and that's not what we're here to do we're specifically here to, to look at, at children but just to kind of set the scene a little bit but the um around the eat well guide and it's used across the UK to help everybody understand what the ideal balance of foods um is for a healthy diet it was published in um, and updated in 2018 and encourages us um, to choose a variety of foods from the five food groups, um, specifically for adults or, or people, children over the age of five, with the five food groups being your starchy carbohydrates, your fruits and vegetables, your protein options, um, your dairy and alternatives, and a very small allowance for oils and spreads. Now that's for adults, okay? Oh, sorry, ch um, children over the age of five, including adults. So here it is, the eat well plate, um, the, and it shows what we should be eating from each food group. And I don't want to dwell on it too long um, because it's, it's slightly different for the children. So I think we'll, we'll move on. But anything, if you've anybody got any queries around the eat well guidance, then I'm more than happy to kind of answer that after, after the session. So next slide is around hydration. Um, again, within your, your settings, um, we should be aiming for children to be eating and uh, to be drinking between one and a half to two litres of, of water a day um, of fluid to stay hydrated. Sugary drinks are one of the main contributors to excess sugar consumption in children and adults. And actually children have taken over adults with the sugar consumption now, which again is, is frightening. And alcohol, it's we don't need to talk about alcohol when it comes to children. So having enough to drink is vitally important for children um, and young people as they're more likely to get dehydrated, especially when being active and when it's hot. So always remain, you know, reminding children within your settings to drink. It's around how um, just little hints and tips and kind of how to promote fresh drinking water, have it chilled. It might be every morning that you have a different citrus fruit put in a, a jug of water and um, talking about, you know, today is, is an orange. This is what an orange looks like, tastes like, and it just changes the flavour um, of, of water and how you promote um, you know, hydration, really um, very important. Next slide, Ali. So a healthy balance diet for children. This is specifically what we are here to, to look at is based on providing food from four main food groups. So you've got your starchy foods, fruit and veg, dairy and alternatives and protein group. Um, and you'll notice that fibre or the little section of fats and oils and spreads, it's not included within children's nutrition um, and guidance. So when it comes to providing your starchy foods, we're looking at four portions a day. Um, and I must note here, I'm, I'm going to touch on portions because portion um, it, within ch child health is, um, is, is a separate webinar. It's, it's a massive topic, 
Um, but I, I can certainly, again, answer any questions if I can at the end around portions. Um, so four portions of your starchy foods. Um, fruit and vegetables, we're looking at five portions um, a day or more. Your dairy and alternatives um, being your um, milk, yogurts, cheese, three portions and your your protein um, portions we're looking um, for two to three portions a day. Next slide, Ali. So this table here um, is looking at the actual nutrients that we that I mentioned earlier um, and it particularly looking at iron and zinc with um, with regards to child health. So iron is really important. It's an important mineral that helps maintain healthy blood. Iron is a major component of haemoglobin, which is a type of protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen from your lungs to all parts of the body. So without iron, there aren't enough red blood cells to transport oxygen, which then leads to fatigue and the likes of um, anemia, which you might, you might, you know, have some some children within your settings that, that you already know that might be anemic um, and it could all come down to to kind of nutrient consumption. Um, zinc is essential for health and it plays a key role in childhood development, the immune system, wound healing and other functions within within the body. But the body doesn't store excess zinc, so it must be obtained from the diet. And this table here quite clearly just gives some examples of different food groups um, and what foods are really good sources of iron and zinc, which I'll, I'll let you read in, in your own time. Next slide, Ali. So how does the guidance differ for children under the ages of five um, and, and those above that age group? Um, the energy requirements shown on the Eat Well Guide apply to adults, we've said that. The menus and recipes re um, referred to in this session and all of the attached resources that you'll get are based on energy requirements for young children. And it's really important that we kind of reiterate that throughout the whole day um, in, in compliance with, with the food, um, voluntary food and drink standards, that an offering of three meals a day and two to three snacks, along with plenty of active play. So, um, that's bringing in the kind of activity element as well. And then given portion sizes appropriate to their age or to let them help themselves or be guided by their appetite. Again, all children are different. They've got different appetites. Some can eat a lot more than others um, and, it's, and it's been guided by the child. Next slide, Ali. So this is where we're looking at um, healthy, balanced, nutritious and sustainable meal provision. So you guys are the experts with regards to the, the early years foundation stage framework. You know it sets out the standards that all early year providers must meet. Um, they ensure that children learn and develop well and are kept healthy and safe. So in introducing sustainable food to early year settings is an opportunity to connect children staff and families to more environmentally friendly habits and to nurture a sustainable food culture. Sustainable food is about food culture and how decisions made about growing, for example, buying, storing, cooking and wasting food today will impact future gen generations. So it's a really, really crucial, um, crucial topic at the moment. And you've probably heard loads of positive terms around sustainability. So words like seasonality, um, organic, sustainable foods, local foods. And um, these are all kind of buzzwords at the moment that, that everybody's um, jumping on and kind of working towards. Next slide, Ali. So meeting the nutritional standards, the voluntary food and drink standards will help address these principles um, around sustainable menus. So, for example, having fewer meat dishes and um, using sustainable fish, um, looking out for labels around MSC, using seasonality and um, seasonal produce, um, sh shopping locally are all, um, you know, huge, huge contributing factors to sustainable menus. Next slide, Ali. So the Food for Life Award, um, looking specifically at the food quality section of the award, 
um, provide, providing sustainable menus supports this criteria massively. So when you're developing your menus, um, making sure that, for example, all the eggs that you provide on your menu are free range, um, that there's no GM or genetically modifi modified ingredients are used on your menu, that there's no nasties like E numbers or additives or um, flavor enhancers, for example, are used. Um, making sure that your animal welfare standards are met so that you're using high quality meat. It might be um, the minimum standard is red tractor, for example. So looking out for a red tractor product or it might be organic product. Um, making sure that no endangered fish is on your menu and that 75% of your menu is, is made freshly prepared, homemade. Um, so these are all the things within the food quality section of Food for Life Award um, to, to be thinking about. Um, so that takes us on to the next slide, which is actually getting into the menu planning side of things. So I've, I hope I've kind of given a bit of background. I know it's a whistle stop tour, but a kind of a background as to where we are, where we need to be, the standards themselves. Um, this particular document is called First Steps Nutrition. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, there's lots of information to take in, but they've you can download these for free um, and they do uh, booklets around snacks, portion sizes, packed lunches, eating well for the first year. Um, they're fantastic and very visual. Um, next slide, Ali. So I did say I'm just going to very quickly touch on portion sizes, but the appetites of children aged between one and four will be very variable. I've mentioned that. And even one child can eat different amounts on, on, of food on different days. Therefore, there isn't one perfect portion that will be appropriate for all. Um, and it's, it's really important that you allow the child to kind of um, to eat to appetite rather than um, kind of being forced as such to say you must finish everything. Um, but yeah, like I said, portion size is, is, is a minefield. It's quite complex. Um, so but what I've just put here is an example of the nutrient. Next slide, Ali, it's portion sizes. The nutrient content of food and drink provided for children depends on the actual portion size. So when we mention nutrients, um, Previously, um, the, the, the first steps nutrition, they've worked with the nutritionist to work out exactly what a portion size would be. So they've done the hard work for everybody, which is amazing. And they put it into a, a, a picture form for us to, to follow. So for example, these have just been taken from um, Food for Life menus. So quite clearly states and shows pictorially that here we've got 125, uh, 120 grams of collie and broccoli gratin, salad and water. Nice and visual. Um, next slide, Ali. And thinking about how you would manage the portion sizes. So some serve a portion, some settings might serve um, smaller portions um, than what's actually recommended and then provide seconds if a child's still hungry. Every setting is different. Others might encourage children to, to self-serve at meal times, so developing their motor, their fine motor skills, um, but also um, kind of self-teaching themselves about portion sizes and portion control, um, which, which is really good and it's all educational. Okay, next slide. So menu planning standards. Um, the menu planning standards here. So what I've done is there's a, a basically broken it down into the four sections. So you've got your breakfast, lunch and tea and your snack offering. And for under each of these headings, I've, I've just done kind of like a basic checklist of what you would need to um, check against. Your menus um, would check against these um, points to double check that what you're providing within your setting is compliant. So breakfast oh sorry next slide ali so let's just kick off with with your breakfast checklist so under the standards there's four things as a setting that you would need to check um that that you are that you're doing 
So one portion of starchy food to be served each day, um, which is quite straightforward. But then it goes on to say that three varieties, so a minimum of three varieties across the week. So we, um, it, it wouldn't be good practice to be offering just white bread or cornflakes every single day. And the reason being is not, not just because of the nutrient content, but also because we're trying to encourage different tastes, different textures, different flavours across the menu um, for children, particularly at such a young age. Um, and then if you are a setting who provides breakfast cereals to be, make sure that they're within the, the sugar and salt regulations, which are which are there. Um, and obviously to avoid the likes of chocolate and sugar coated cereals at all costs. Um, again, the next the third one down is to provide one portion of fruit and veg every morning, and this could be in the, the um, form of fresh, cooked, tinned, dried. Um, whatever is is kind of accessible. Um, and to pri provide only fresh tap water and plain milk um, throughout breakfast. So four things to kind of um, just be aware of um, for your breakfast. And then next slide, Ali, is just a little opportunity for you. I'm just going to grab a quick drink and um, have a read through the, the slides here. So which of these would be balanced breakfasts for young children, bearing in mind the, the standards that we've that we've talked about. So the first one being um, cornflakes with whole milk with raisins and a glass of water, frosted flakes and skim milk with a glass of orange, toast with spread, banana slices and a glass of milk, porridge with sultanas and a glass of milk, scrambled egg and sausage on toast with a glass of water or porridge and a glass of milk. So all I want you to do is just in the chat or just in your head a couple of minutes, just have a think which of those would be classed as um, a balanced breakfast under the under the standards. Yeah, excellent. Lots of Lots of answers coming through here. Fabulous. One, three and four. Excellent. Well done, guys. Would be um, examples of, of balanced breakfasts. Well done. OK, next slide. Um, conscious of time. So I'm just moving on to lunch tea um, checklists. And again, there's quite a lot to kind of when you are planning your menus here to, to think about when it comes to lunch and tea, because these are the biggest um, uh, providers um, with regards to kind of nutrients and, and energy content. But each lunch and dinner should contain a main course and a dessert. One starchy food every day and again with a variety. So not great practice to be offering white pasta every single day. So again, textures, tastes, so whether it's a couscous one day, whether it's a pasta the other day, whether it's a potato um, product the, the next day, just to give variety, different tastes and different textures. Um, so one portion of fruit or veg per meal every day, and again, a variety. And I've just put in there in brackets, if a child is staying for full meal provision, including snacks, um, throughout the whole of the day, they should be offered five or more portions of fruit and veg every day. Um, one portion of meat, fish or alternative being kind of beans, um, pulses per meal. Um, your meat products have just popped in there. So kind of your processed meat products like sausages or burgers if they're bought in. Um, fish products, again, if they're, they're bought in, so the likes of fish fingers, um, fish burgers, fish fillets, things like that, um, no more than once per week. Um, one lunch a week contains a meat alternative or pulses, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and one portion of oily fish, for example, salmon, mackerel or sardines, at least once every three weeks. Um, and just note that I'm sure everybody's aware, but just in case you're not, that tinned tuna does not count towards an, being an oily fish. And the reason being is because um, in the canning process, 
the omega-3 and omega-6 oils are destroyed in the process. So unfortunately, you, you, you can't get away with um, putting um, tuna down as, a, as an oily fish. Next slide, Ali. So again, quite often I'll get questions around what what give me examples of what is a non dairy protein for vegetarians, which comes under um, under the standards. So I've just popped down some there and again, I've got recipes for all of these. So if anybody was is really struggling to kind of incorporate more um, non dairy protein into their into the diet and into their menus, please do shout, send us an email at the end. So the likes of corn curries, you know, the, the, the young mild spices, um, baked bean, add in baked beans to curries, jacket potatoes, I've put down, I've got recipes for chickpea patties, enchiladas, um, moussacas, using lentils and, and mini frittatas, things like that. So there's a huge amount of recipes out there that can be tweaked um, and used um, within your settings. And again, more than happy to share where we can. Next slide, Ali. So tea time meals, and this is, again, we get loads of questions around this. So the tea time meal can be really tricky for settings as many um, children may be leaving at different times and may or not may or may not be having a main meal at home with the family. So you, you might have some children go, but some children stay. And it's about having that communication with with the child's parent or carer. So as a general rule of thumb, a child in full day care until roughly between half five and six say, um, and not having a meal at home um, should have a full day's food intake, including the snack. So mid afternoon snack and tea time meal with a dessert. Um, a child that's been picked up at roughly about four o'clock say and going home to have a meal with the family um, should be given and offered the mid afternoon snack before being picked up. And then a child being picked up at say half four or f between half four and five and having a small meal or supper snack at home, your setting may provide a tea time light meal for these children using the menu ideas discussed um, shortly. We'll come on to snacks in a moment. Um, but every setting, like I said, is different um, and it's kind of being able to implement these standards within your settings um, and, and your children. OK, so next slide, Ali. So do these example meals um, meet guidance? So this could be a lunch or a tea, um, depending on you know, your setting and when you would offer something like these are just examples. So again, just a couple of minutes, um, just have a read through the, the meals and in the chat or just to yourself. Um, would you think that these would be examples um, of of compliant meals. So potato and vegetable curry with rice and naan, plain yogurt and mango cubes with a uh, with a drink of water, vegetable sticks, hummus dip and cubes of cheese, fruit and ice cream. You've got a spag ball made with minced beef or it could be lentils and um, baked apple and custard with a drink of water. And then you've got sausages, potato wedges and spaghetti hoops, a sponge pudding and custard. So again, just a couple of minutes. Which ones would you say would be compliant? Okie dokie. Great. Yeah. OK, so let's just look at the potato curry would be absolutely. Yep. Um, the vegetable sticks. Um, no, because this is a snack, not a meal. Um, and ice cream obviously is not great as a snack. Um, your spaghetti bolognese. Absolutely. Yep. Um, because it's got your your protein, your veg, you've got your baked apples for dessert. You've got your and custard. You've got a drink of water. Absolutely. Sun right on my arm. Um, and then the last one, sausages, potato wedges and spaghetti hoops with a sponge pudding and custard wouldn't be obviously because there's no offering at all there of, um, of fruit and vegetables. Next slide, Ali. OK, 
Okay, so desserts, puddings and cakes. Again, get asked quite a lot about desserts. So desserts, puddings and cakes make made with cereals. So for example, rice and oats, milk and fruit can be included as part of a healthy balanced diet for young children as well. And desserts um, and cakes, they provide energy and the essential nutrients such as calcium and iron, particularly for this age group. And this is why it's recommended to provide a dessert as part of lunch and tea each day because of the, child, the child's needs, nutritional needs. Um, and again, not just the energy and the calorie intake and requirements, but also for different tastes and textures and um, uh, becoming familiar with with lots of different um, different foods throughout the day. Next slide, Ali. So I've just given here some examples. So a, 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 examples of fruit based puddings homemade where possible would be the likes of stewed fruit, crumbles, tarts and muffins. All can be made um, quite easily, healthily within the standards. And then you've got the likes of your milk based puddings, so custard, rice pudding, and then your natural yogurt and fromage free falls into falls into that section as well. Next slide, Ali. So some desserts um, should be avoided or limited. So which ones? So from the list here, um, given you've got apple crumble, rice pudding, yogurt and fruit, instant whip, carrot cake, fruit salad and chocolate chip cookies. Can you just again jog down on, on the chat um, the ones that should be limited and the ones that should be avoided um, if you can? Just a minute or so. Whilst we're waiting, Nelly, we've got a couple of good questions coming into the chat. Yeah, um, sure. So we had Kenyon ask um, if they have dessert at lunch, should they have it again at tea? And then Cara asked, uh, would number one, which was the sweet potato curry, I think, not be too starchy if it contains potatoes, rice and naan? Perfect, thank you. Um, good questions, really good questions. So it is recommended that a, a dessert is offered at lunch and dessert, um, at, at lunch and tea, sorry. Um, it doesn't, when people talk about desserts, I think most people might think of them you know as a sponge or cake or biscuits things like that but a dessert um like what we're just kind of talking about now could be the likes of a fruit-based dessert so it could just be fruit and yogurt it could just be fruit um things like that so it is recommended to have a dessert with your lunch and the tea serving yeah and with regards to the curry I'm just going back again to the slide. Potato and vegetable curry with rice and naan, plain yogurt and mango cubes. Yes, so it's, it is quite starchy, but it would depend on, um, I suppose, the portion control. So it would, I'd like to think this particular, I think this is just an example, but I'd like to think that the, ri that the rice portion would be halved if there was an offering of naan as well, and there's also potato in there as well. Um, so yes, you're absolutely correct and good point, um, but it, it all comes down to portion control. And this is where we probably need another webinar around specifically portions and you know what constitutes a, a, a meal with regards to portions like something, a dish like this. Fabulous, thank you. Um, OK, next slide, Ali. Oh, sorry. No. So which ones should be um, avoided or limited? So what I've got down here is I think most of you have got it spot on. Um, so to limit the likes of chocolate chip cookies, um, obviously, and then to avoid the, um, the, the instant whips. And the reason being is because um, they tend to be and I'm not saying all of them, but I'm, I'm saying they tend to be um, very little if if any fruit in, in instant whips, a lot of it's made up of um, additives, trans fats, flavorings, things like that, which obviously within Food for Life, it's not really um, what we want. So next slide, Ali. Um, this is where we're looking at the checklist for drinks. So quite straightforward. 
Um, you guys know already that it's a welfare requirement of the early years foundation stage that fresh drinking water is available and accessible for children throughout the day. The only drinks that should be provided with snacks um, and between meals are water and milk. Um, and the reason being is because um, these don't damage children's teeth. And the only drinks that should be provided with meals, again, are water and milk. Um, all other drinks, the likes of squashes and, and fizzy drinks, should and anything with caffeine should be avoided um, full stop, really. And it's about how you promote within your um, within your setting, you know, and, and make water and and you know hydration quite a, an integrated part of the day. Um, that are inaccessible for the child. Um, I've just popped in the next slide is the dangers of sugary drinks. Again, I'll just let you look at that in, in kind of your own time, but it just kind of shows how easily it is to um, increase your calorie intake over the course of the week by having the likes of sugary squashes, fizzy drinks every single day. So, for example, on a Monday, two large glasses of squash, which is easily done as a even as an adult, really easily done. Um, I presume with that one being 250 calories, that's a full sugar um, squash. Um, and I know these days you can get no added sugar or sugar free. Um, and again, the likes of the, the fizzy drink at 215 calories, you're looking at a full fat, full sugar um, fizzy drink there. But over the course of the week, there's an excess of 1700 calories um, added to that child's day, for example. So it just shows you how, how dangerous um, without really realising um, that sugar is in the body. Um, so the next slide is just uh, for your information, really a maximum sugar for young children. Um, so for two uh, children um, of rough, roughly two years of age, no more than three cubes, just so that you can uh, visually imagine what that what that's like. Um, three year olds, no more than four cubes and four to six year olds, no more than than five cubes. And again, when we um, come on to portions um, in the next um, session, if, if that's something that's kind of needed, then we would look at different products um, and how much kind of sugar is in certain products. Next slide, Ali. So um, the, and this is the, the, the last section um, It's looking at snacks. Um, all within kind of the full day food offer. So again, this resource from First, First Step Nutrition is absolutely fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. Um, so to provide at least three varieties of starchy food, foods each week. Um, so the likes of oat cakes, crackers, breadsticks, a variety of fruit and veg across the week. Um, but a reminder that no dried or fruit juice through, um, for snacks. Um, because of the, the sugar that can lie on their teeth and, and rot and decay their teeth. Water and milk are the only drinks that should be provided between meals. We've already mentioned that. Um, no sweet foods um, like cakes and biscuits and providing um, your, your protein kind of options one to two times per week um, is a recommend, recommended amount. So I'm just going to break um, the snacks down a little bit more just to kind of um, hopefully get make it clear um because it's quite it's quite in depth so this slide here just shows the importance um of snacks and that they do make up 30 percent of the energy requirements throughout the day um and try and think of them as um as mini meals and try where possible to kind of get that feeling or thinking of snack to being a quick go to, you know, like a quick biscuit will just have a snack or a snack is something, you know, like a, a commercial bag of crisp type puff snack and um, particularly with children of that age, um, they're kind of trying to move away from that, that um, snacks are actually should be thought of as a as a mini meal. So next slide, Ali. So good choices of snacks. And I've got some examples just to show you. Um, would be the likes of starchy foods. So pita breads, crackers, breadsticks. I'm sure the majority of you are, are already offering these types of foods. Um, your fruits and veg, um, such as slices of fruit, vegetable sticks. And it all comes down to how, how snacks are presented 
to, to children particularly whether they'll eat them or not and um, so I know exactly for my children if I give them an apple they're not interested if I give them a chopped up apple with I don't know, something else on the plate they're more than likely to eat it um, and it's the size of their hand and the portion again come back to portions and um, kind of what's um, what's suitable for the hand size so milk and dairy foods such as milk to drink, hard cheese, cheese spreads, all good um, examples of, of snack choices. But remember to, um, to avoid for snacks, not, not during the meal, but for snacks, dried fruit for the, and things like malt loaf, for example. They've got a, a, a really high sugar content because of the, the dried fruit, which then sticks to the children's teeth throughout the day and contributes to, um, to kind of dental health. Um, sweet foods, as we've we've said, such as cakes, biscuits and sweets and to avoid crisps um, for a snack choice. But variety is key to keep the taste buds alive. We all get bored of eating the same thing, even as adults. If you have the same thing in your pack lunch every single day, you just get bored and you get sick of things. It's exactly the same with children. So, um, you know, trying to get the excitement within your setting about oh wonder what's for snack today wonder what's you know you know just to kind of keep that um interest um kind of alive next slide ali so next couple of slides are just just some examples and all i've done is i've taken them from the first steps nutrition document i've cut them out and i've popped them into a slide just to give you an example um of of what could be provided so sardines on toast with celery um, and it quite clearly shows that you're getting your, or the children will be getting the fruit and veg, starchy food and protein from, um, from the sardine. Next example, Ali, is there scotch pancakes with sliced banana and strawberry, for example. Doesn't have to be that fruit, it can be whatever, um, whatever you fancied. It could be a crumpet instead of a, um, a pancake, could be pita bread, things like that. And then the next example there, um, is a mini avocado and tomato salsa sandwich, um, which sounds very appealing. Um, and again, compliant in, in terms of, of the recommendations for a snack. Next slide, Ali. So I've popped here, um, again, I've taken this from um, the First Steps Nutrition document, and I've just said here that sent to kind of get the communication with the parents, for example, to send these ideas back to the parents on a weekly basis. It might be um, that you upload a snack of the week every every week or a snack of the day, just so that parents are, are taking away some tips as well. Um, and this is where fussy eating comes in as um as well so it might be that the child has never tried a sardine before and they just go oh i'm not eating that so it's an, an opportunity for the parent or the carer at home to then try these things that might be provided on your menu um a child it takes a child between 12 and 14 tastes of a product or a food um type to actually become familiar with it so they might refuse it the first time they might refuse it the the next six or eight times but gradually as they see a particular product or food type on the on the menu being presented they, they'll gradually try it um, and it's about repetition as well so really trying to get the parents involved as well um, and shouting and showcasing about the good work that you guys are doing and the menus that you're serving because it takes a huge amount of time and effort to develop a really good menu um, so really, once once you've nailed it and you've cracked it, it's about screaming about it and, and telling everybody about the good work and good food that you're serving. Um, the next slide, Ali, is this is just an example of a meal checklist that's in the Food for Life um, file um, that you can. It's it's quite simplistic, clear. So if you've got your menu and you want to kind of um, compare and just check that everything that you've got everything there this resource is fantastic to do that against um, i'm really conscious of time here i'm just going to finish off by the next slide is on role modeling very quickly just to um to touch on it again this is probably another webinar in itself but parents siblings family members friends can all be powerful role models for children within your setting um, the children learn through simply watching 
what other people and what staff are doing. So whether it's um, at lunchtime, for example, um, to actually sit with the children, I'm not saying every day might be on a rota, but children look up to adults um, and staff, particularly in settings. And if they see you eating sardines on toast with celery, then the next week they might do the same. Um, and it's like, oh, so copied behaviour. Um, it's really, really important. And another thing, just a little tip. Um, for example, I can't stand sardines, but I would never allow myself to, to, to show my children that I don't like them. Um, it's, it's been as positive as you possibly can um, around food and promoting kind of good behaviours around food. Um, I'm not going to touch on food allergies, so I'm going to, again, another um, uh, webinar in itself or session in itself. But just really the, the point here that I wanted to, to make was that many parents think that their child might be allergic to a, a certain food, but always make sure within your setting, if that is the case, that you have a letter provided by the GP, because quite often it's the case that actually they're just a little bit fussy or they don't like it or the parents scared that they don't eat anything all day so they say that they're allergic to it so it really is having that communication with the parent um around kind of food allergies and intolerances um next slide ali um and again just when you're um uh, com you know compiling your menus just to factor in um culture religion um vegetarian vegan fussy eaters um, and then more specific medical needs as well. So you might have to um, tailor or tweak your, your menu to, to suit different um, dietary requirements. So likes of celiac, um, CMPA, um, but again, always refer back to um, uh, uh, making sure that you've got a medical note. Next slide, Ali. Lee, somebody oh. just asked just for a bit of clarification about the yes. GP letter. Yes. Yeah, they've just said, uh, would you mind going back a slide? Uh, just, yeah, I think they just wanted a bit more certainty about the GP letter. Sure. So about that special, a parent requ re requesting a special diet. Yeah, of course. So if, for example, um, you you have a child or a parent who comes in and says that their child um, is allergic to whatever it might be. Um, obviously, you would have to take that on board, and from that from that moment, you would not provide that food to to that child at all. But in the meantime, there should be um, a process within your setting on how to deal with special diets. So and encourage you can't you can't force anybody to 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 have a letter from their GP, but um, there should be processes from the top from management and um, within your setting um, around how you deal with special diets. Um, and that's that's something um, that could be done on a one to one with um, with the with the setting and the parent. Um, but ideally, if you can get a backup from your GP um, around, because if it is really a, a genuine allergy, there'll be documentation from you, from the doctor or the hospital um, around a, a certain allergy. If it's an intolerance, that's slightly different, um, where they might, you might not have gone to the GP, so you can't get a letter, but the, your child or the child um, maybe comes out with a rash or hives or something, and, and the parent is telling you that, then again, you you don't you, you would have to get them to fill in the the various forms within your setting, um, and from from that day forward, you wouldn't offer that that again that food again to that child. So it's and again, every setting's different. Is how you how you kind of your processes um, are in place, but it's encouraged, and we would recommend where possible to to get some sort of formal or letter from the GP if you can, but it's not always you can't always do that. Um, but as a setting, um, there needs to be pr um, processes in place um, whilst when developing your menu against as well the 14 allergens um, that are now 
um, out there that we all kind of are aware of. And again, I haven't put the allergens into this specific um, webinar just because it is another topic. It's another kind of session. And again, I'm more than happy to, um, to contact me directly after the webinar via email, phone call, um, and I can talk through kind of processes and any documentation within your setting that might be helpful. If that's OK, does that answer that one? Yeah. OK, so um, without further ado, I'm going to stop there um, and hope that that has given you. I know it's a whistle stop tour and I'm, I'm totally conscious that it's 10 past five. Um, um, I'm going to pass across to Maple Tree Nursery and Preschool um, from Walsall and we have Leanne Prothero and Jessica Gunn on hopefully on the call um, who are going to talk through their um, their case study and just kind of give us some hints and tips and examples of good practice um, about what they've done within their setting um, to 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 get to this point of compliant menus and promoting and providing really, really good food within their setting. Um, so yes, over to you guys. Hi, uh, I'm Leanne. I'm the Deputy uh, Nursery Manager here uh, at Maple Tree. Um, just to give you a bit of a brief outside, um, we are a 82 place nursery a day. We have about 114 on site. Um, so obviously we've got a large um, case with a cache of children on here and we've got one chef who bless our cooks for about 69 children a day um so kind of it all came about in a roughly about 2018 for us um where we signed up for um through Warsaw early years of food for life uh, and our manager attended the training obviously this is where jess obviously went on her training um to do all of that um so really we looked at the four areas obviously the food quality the food leadership and culture the food education the community partnerships and kind of went from there really um so firstly we looked at sort of like the food quality and what we do um so we looked at our sort of processed foods so obviously we used to serve fish fingers um but kind of we adapted that now and we serve fresh um fish fresh fillet fish from there um, and obviously we reviewed our breakfast as well um so we steer away from sort of the ultra processed food um, and we serve sort of like wheat bix corn flakes and offer them fruit to go with that as well um again we because we are such an a big asian community um within our setting um so obviously we look towards our cultural um and dietary needs in the nursery and um, so we started off by sending um questionnaires out um to all our parents to get some feedback on what they would like sort of within the nursery and um, so to cater for all of those we sort of a few ideas we kind of went down like a mushroom curry um, we we had the doll menu, and um, we had the roast dinners. Um, so obviously, it's still so we can, you know, implement and promote that you can still eat healthily from different cultures that we have on site as well. Um, the way we cater for our allergies because we have a lot of allergies um, within our setting. Um, so to make it a little bit easier for our chef, being sort of a sole um, one on her <coughs> own. Um, we use different coloured plates. So, for example, if anyone has a dairy-free diet, um, we cater for that by using a yellow plate. Um, and then sort of like we have a gluten-free, again, that's a red plate and so on. If there's no fish, we have a blue plate. Um, so that kind of helps us know um, where we are from there. We do provide separate menus as well. So, for example, we've got um, a couple of children that are celiac. So we'll, um, we've not only looked at kind of the menu for the children with, with no dietary requirements, we've adapted a menu specifically for children with certain dietary requirements to ensure that we're meeting all children's needs with the most healthy menu that we possibly can. Um, we are a vegetarian nursery. So um, for us, we look at a lot of... Um, providing proteins that obviously are non-dairy so for example we um will do a, a five bean salad with our jacket potatoes um we do kidney beans in our chili con carne chickpeas in our bolognese so we just look at adapting kind of the menu in that way to ensure that we're providing enough protein and a well a balanced and round diet in that way um uh, we've also got as well um literally right at the back of us it's just down our driveway um, we have an allotment, um, which we've got a great um, relationship with the community um, in there. And I do allow us to take our children to help grow 
um, our own sort of herbs, our own vegetables, and we've also brought that back into our garden. So the children, I've actually been going quite a lot of stuff. And then we use that then to cook their own meals. So that's kind of getting them involved in their education side um, of food for life as well. The thing with that as well is we look at obviously from a from a, a cost point of view, being efficient with that is, you know, we look at adapting um, toilet roll holders and things like that, where we can make them into plant pots with cardboard and we'll send home like just a pea for them to grow at home. So you've got that partnership with with parents as well as um, the, the growing at home. And yeah, from that, we'll... Um, we'll do kind of we'll send home a, a menu idea so pea soup for example whilst they grow their own pea at home so they've got an idea that just because they've grown something it doesn't get chucked away that can actually go into eating for themselves and they can grow it from fresh yeah um we also held a plant and share week um so we invited our parents to come in and actually do some planting and growing their own um sort of we had peas and was it sunflowers at the time um, so obviously then we did a bit of a competition to make the children a bit more engaged in, you know, keeping that going. Um, and then obviously we give them a little prize at the end. Um, and that was our parent partnership there as well. Um, we also, to kind of get all this, um, we actually took our children to Selfields Farm, which is obviously the working farm. Um, so obviously they really engaged in the tractor ride, um, going in the meadow, obviously seeing how things were working and where their food was kind of produced and all that, which was quite engaged with, with the parents as well. Um, yeah, so like I said, we've got snack times, again, which you've already spoken about. We, we have our protein, we have our hummus, our Greek yoghurt. Um, but like Jess has already said, we make sure that we've always got a protein, a carb, a vegetable and a fruit. Um, and again, we always make sure that we look at our portion sizes on site to make sure that children are getting the correct vitamins and the correct minerals from that meal that they're having um, throughout the day. Um, and then Jess went on some training following that. Uh, yeah, um, I did a, oral yeah, health, didn't you? a nutrition and oral health. So um, obviously with the new um, development matters and things like that that have come out, every setting in the early years have got to be um, providing information about um, oral health. Um, we we've been on a lot of courses with food for life that have been really really interesting and really insightful and they've sent us some really good resources um which we've been able to adapt and use in the setting um so for example snack time we're sending home you know snack ideas and meal ideas and that also comes under oral health because by ensuring that parents are feeding their children healthy foods with lower sugar that we're then promoting good oral health at home um so protecting children's teeth so you know we're sending home ensuring that children are drinking milk drinking water healthy snacks that aren't crisps that aren't biscuits other alternatives that they can have at home that are not only good for their diet and their health but also good for their oral health um we also kind of look at popular meals that we've got in the setting and meals that aren't being eaten so you know it's just kind of changing and adapting to what the children like um because obviously we don't have something on the menu that they're not eating um, so we found that quite popular in our setting, um, the five bean salad was one that shocked us. We didn't think the no, children would no. enjoy it, but they actually really did. Um, and we have that with our jack potato. Sometimes we'll have some children, they'll eat the salad before anything else on the plate. So it's kind of one of those, unless you offer it, you know, we all sat down beforehand and said, you know, we think that might be something we'll have to adapt. But it turned out they loved it. So offering the children things that you think they might not like, like you said with the mackerel earlier, and the sardines it's shocking how much they do really enjoy it yeah i mean we swapped our tuna pasta back to the mackerel and was like oh no this probably ain't gonna work but they actually eat it better being the mackerel than they do the tuna didn't they mm -hmm. um so like you say we put the kidney beans in the chili you know we've all the vegetable stir fry we, we kind of adapt all that they have um, a piece of fruit after tea time um if they'd like that and also we do offer them sort of fruit in the cereal so most of the day they've always got fruit and veg haven't they going mm. um throughout the day um but since we've kind of started food for life um the things that have kind of worked well for our setting are the parents have really got in you know on board and really engaged with you know asking for further menus and you know asking us to adapt them and even with their dietaries we just send them a menu home we work closely on a one-to-one -one. Um, to make sure that we're still incorporating our food for life, but we sort of cater in for those as well. Um, I mean, one of our children um, have had their own toaster just to make sure everything's going right. We obviously include all that for him. Um, you know, our healthy meals, the children are actually eating a lot better since we've adapted onto food for life. 
um, you know, we adapt our menus, obviously, if we need to, you know, regarding their allergies and dietaries and sort of what's going well and what's not going well. Um, obviously, we've got the really good connections with the allotments around the back. Um, and, you know, parents are engaging in making sure that the healthy foods are happening at home as well. Um, you know, we're finding more interested in new activities coming from the resources that we've had. Um, and like I say, we've had brilliant training from Food for Life and we feel like the resource packs have really, really helped yeah, us in our setting really good. Um, to even provide for our staff and for our children and even our parents. Yeah, yeah. I think that's another a good point to touch on is um, it can be daunting um, starting something new and changing your menus, especially if you know you've got children in your setting that can be fussy eaters. But it all kind of rolls into one in the end because you've got them growing outside. We've got big planters and then them digging up potatoes, the joy on their face. Like yeah. it's, it's silly things like that that you don't think of that really encourages them to eat. And I think going on their courses and, and listening to people talk, as much as it educates your children, it educates yourself as well. So when parents are coming to ask you questions or people are asking you questions to do with the menus, you feel like you've got the answers for them and you're confident in being able to talk to people about it. So whereas before, you know, you might say, well, we put it on the menu because it's healthy. It's an easy, you know, answer to say, whereas I feel like now we've got more jurisdiction in what we say. We can confidently answer questions about health and nutrition due to going on the course you know, and implementing them in the setting. So it's a great confidence boost for obviously not only the children, but for the staff as well, because it gives them that confidence to be able to be a good role model for the children, as well as answer those questions to parents that might want additional information. Yeah, I mean, for us, our main you know, getting these menus together for us is that parent engagement when they first come through the door, settling them into nursery. Um, then that kind of, the staff kind of work something out in their room together. Then they come and meet with us, um, with the chef and myself and Jess, and we sit down and then we look to see what's going to be best for her to cook for, like you said, the 70 children, nearly enough that she cooks for on her own. Um, so we just have to kind of say, okay, this is going to work for, say, 15 dietaries we've got today, 15 allergies, you know, work alongside the culture, and we've got the healthy balance. So we sit in a, meet, like a, um, a meeting, work all that out. Um, and then we then send that off to the parents then to say, is there anything further you'd like on this? Or, you know, have you got any ideas that you think we might need to swap? Um, and then once we don't have any feedback back saying that, you know, anything needs changing and it all comes back as good feedback, that's when the menus kind of come to mm. life. But we tend to have sort of what's classed as a winter menu and a summer menu. Um, so we are in the process now of, communicating with our parents, getting our new summer menu ready to sort of heat sort of our end of April, beginning of May time now. Yeah. So that's our next step, really. But as I say, it can be daunting. But once you've got it all rolling and once you've got the activities going and the menus are in place, it runs so smoothly. Yeah. The activity ideas and, you know, you're getting ready for certain times of years to start planting. It, the activity ideas are really good. Getting the children out in the garden, outside, exercising, planting, things like that. It's, they're lovely activities. And, yeah. you know, it's such a good educational yeah. tool to have. Yeah. They're and, um, eating better now. They're taking part in their planting and growing because they can see what they're producing and what's good for them. So it's worked really well for us. So, but yeah, that's kind of our food for life in a nutshell over the few years. Oh, that, thank you so much, Leanne and Jessica. This has been really informative. Um, I just love the fact that from from J dot when you started this that you've you've made the you know the communication um, key with the parents got them involved sending back um, menus and snack ideas um, it's it's the key to success really isn't it um, and it it, it's it's also a work in progress as well doesn't these things don't happen overnight. Um, yeah. And it, it's it's building up trust as well and trying. I love that with the bean salad. Um, I'm going to try that with my boys, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, but it yeah. does work well. I mean, my little one won't eat healthy at all, but she'll eat it here. And I'm like, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's copied behaviour. It's been yeah. a brilliant role model, which we've, we've touched on. Um, and it's trying new things. It's getting stuck in. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to hear that, you, that you're loving the resource pack and, and the support. The resource packs are so good, yeah come from Food for Life. So that's really good to hear. But thank you ever so much for your time. And I'm sure if there's anybody else on, on the call who has questions for you guys, I'm sure um, you know, you'll be happy to answer them via email or a phone call at any time. Yeah, um, yeah. thank you. Thank you massively for, for your time. Really appreciate that. 
OK, so um, that really takes us to to the end of, of our webinar. Um, there was an activity um, around planning a menu, um, but we haven't got time to do it. So you will get these slides and really it was just an opportunity to take maybe 10, 15 minutes and um, think about what we've kind of talked about today to plan a five day menu for lunch, tea, um, breakfast and snacks. But you can do that um, as you know, as, as a setting. If you've got some time to, to kind of to work on that, that would be great. Um, I'm aware that there's um, uh, very little time um, and I've not been obviously I'm, I, I can't see what's kind of going on in, in, in the chat. But the last thing, if everybody would be OK, um, literally in the chat um, on a scale of one to five. So this is this is the post um, on a scale of one to five. How confident now do you feel? Um, around kind of having a go at planning a compliant menu. So I'll just pop in a, a number. Don't need to say anything. Um, how how kind of so one being um, not confident and five very confident. Um, and I think Chloe, am I right in thinking you're popping in a, a link, an evaluation link at the end? Yeah, I've, yeah. I've put that in the chat. I'll just um, I'll put it in again at the bottom of everybody's because um, it's really great to see those numbers on your confidence coming through. Um, but I'll just put it in again at the bottom there. It's a really, really quick survey. But if we can get a little bit of um, feedback on who's coming to our training and what you got out of it, then it helps us to get more funding so we can run more of these sorts of sessions. So if you can, just a couple of minutes filling that in, it's really, really helpful to us. Um, and yeah, so brilliant to have so many of you here. Fabulous. Thank you, Chloe. And um, I've just on the last slide here, I've, I've popped my email address. So um, I'm conscious that it, it was it was quite it was fast going. If there's anything that's kind of touched a nerve or you think, oh, I'd really like some extra support on that. Um, uh, please drop me an email and I'm, this is what I'm here for. I'm here to support you guys with kind of many development, anything nutritional and um, within your settings to get you to where you want to be with regards to kind of food for life or beyond. Um, so please do. And I'm, I'm apologies. I'm not able to kind of answer each and every individual question now, but I'd still